Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God. I'd like to talk about the original Christian, the original Catholic view of the Godhead. You know, how did the original church view the divine ones? Uh, we know God is one, but how is God one? Various ones had different uh, ideas. So I'd like to go basically through scripture and church history find out what the original church taught, when most people who profess Christ changed, who still believes the original position at this day, and some of the even prophetic ramifications of the differences of views on the Godhead. Well, as most everybody realizes or accepts who confesses, professes Christianity, the Father was considered to be God, and Jesus was considered to be God, the Lord, the Son of God, our High Priest, and our Savior. Uh, saints like Polycarp and Melito wrote about this. Let me read something from Polycarp of Smyrna. A Polycarp of Smyrna, in case you don't know who he was, was appointed by the Apostle John. And he wrote, Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, Jesus Christ himself, who is the Son of God, now may the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the eternal high priest himself, the God Jesus Christ. So he wrote this in the early 2nd century, not too long after the final book of the uh, New Testament was written, a few decades later, we guess. Now, Melito was a successor to Polycarp, and he wrote, Father and God of truth, then Savior, head of the Lord, his simple divinity. And it's true that the Father is God, and Jesus is our divine High Priest and Savior. Now, I'd like to read something from the Bible. First from Jesus. I'm going to go to John chapter 14, and I'll read verse 6. Now, most of the time I'm going to be reading passages today, I'm going to be using uh, Greco-Roman accepted translations of the Bible, meaning positions or translations done or approved by the Greek Orthodox Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church or the Roman Catholic Church. And this is consistent with something we've been doing. We have a free book called Beliefs of the Original Catholic Church. Now this book and any other book I may hold up is available for free online at www.ccog.org. That's ccog.org. Just go to the literature tab under books and booklets and you can find this. Well, anyway, to, in order to show Greco-Roman Catholics as well as Protestants that we haven't changed the scriptures, we've been again using uh, their translations. So Jesus said, John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And Peter, in Acts chapter 4, And this is from uh, the EOB, the Eastern Orthodox Bible. The other one was from the NJB, which is New Jerusalem Bible. Starting verse 9, uh, Peter mentions Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Then down in verse 12, Peter says, There is salvation in no one else, and there is no other name under heaven that's given among mortals by which we should be saved. Salvation is only available through the way of Jesus. God the Father sent him that the world through him may be saved. And there's salvation in no one else. Now the Apostle Paul in Acts uh, 17 said, I'm going to read verse 29. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. So we see here, in terms of the nature of God or the Godhead, we're not supposed to be saying anything would do with silver, gold, or stone, or shaping, that kind of a thing. And the Jews at the time also basically agreed with that. It's like, you can't represent God with those kinds of things. Now, I'd like to go to Ephesians chapter 3. I'm going to start with verse 14. And I'm going to read this from 
uh, the uh, uh, OSB, which is also the same as the New King James, by the way, something that Paul wrote. Cutting into verse 14, Paul wrote, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. So between Paul's statement in uh, Acts 17, as well as what he wrote here in Ephesians 3, we see basically a family relationship mentioned. The fact that Jesus often used the term the Father also shows a family relationship. The Godhead is a family relationship. Now, I took a class from Fuller Theological Seminary uh, uh, in terms of their church history class, their graduate level class. And one of the books I had to uh, read, or was assigned to read, was called The Trinitarian Controversy. And I'd like to read something from that book. Now, this regards New Testament statements on the components of the Godhead. And this is from a Trinitarian scholar. Okay? So, Fuller Book Theological Seminary, by the way, they're Trinitarian. And here's what William Rush, who's a Trinitarian scholar, wrote. The Binitarian formulas, Binitarian, what is that? Most people have never even heard of that, even though that's the original belief. And I'll get to how the word came forth later. The Binitarian formulas are found in Romans 8.11, 2 Corinthians 4.14, Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Ephesians 1.20, 1 Timothy 1.2, 1, 1 Peter 1.21, and John, 2 John 1.13. No doctrine of the Trinity in the Nicene sense, that's the Council of Nicaea, which it was really the Council of Constantinople came to do that later, is present in the New Testament. Furthermore, he writes, there is no doctrine of the Trinity in the strict sense in the Apostolic Fathers. So let's talk about a couple things here. What are the Apostolic Fathers? The Apostolic Fathers are the people who were around after the Apostles. I mentioned, for example, a Polycarp of Smyrna. This is an artist's sculpture. We really don't know what Polycarp looked like. He would be considered, quote, apostolic father, as were other uh, early church leaders uh, in the second century. But notice that this Trinitarian says there's no doctrine of the Trinity in the New Testament, really, and there's not one in the strict sense in the Apostolic Fathers, which means, hmm, was it probably, perhaps it was not an original view. Now, there's a document that's been called the oldest complete Christian sermon that survived. It's also known as the uh, second letter of Clement, even though we have no idea who actually uh, wrote it. And it also supports an idea of Binitarianism. It was probably given within a year or so of uh, the Apostle John's death, although some have suggested actually that a, a Roman bishop by the name of Soter wrote it around uh, 170. But here's what it says. Brothers, we ought so to think of Jesus Christ as of God, as a judge of the living and the dead. So the idea that early Christians or professors of Christ thought Jesus was God is part of this. It also, the sermon also says, So then, brothers, if we do the will of God our Father. So we see again, the Father is called God, the Son is called Jesus, God. That's a Benetarian view. The word by means to. Let me continue here. Now the church, again this is from the same sermon, being spiritual was revealed in the flesh of Christ, thereby showing us that if any of us guard her in the flesh and do not corrupt her, he will receive her back again in the Holy Spirit. For this flesh is a copy of the Spirit. No one, therefore, who corrupts the copy will share in the original. This, therefore, is what he means, brothers. Guard the flesh in order you may receive of the Spirit. Now, if we say that the flesh is the church and the spirit is Christ, 
then the one who abuses the flesh abuses the church. Consequently, such a person will not receive the spirit, which is Christ's. So great is the life and immortality which this flesh is able to receive, because we don't have it yet, if the Holy Spirit is closely joined with it, that no one is able to proclaim or tell what things the Lord has prepared for his chosen ones. So we see it's called the oldest preserved Christian sermon outside the New Testament. Father is God. Son is God. Spirit is something Christ has and he gives. Now I'd like to read something from Jesus from Matthew 11, verse 27. And this will be from the New Jerusalem Bible. Jesus taught Matthew 11, verse 27. Everything has been entrusted to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, just as no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Now notice that Jesus, our Savior, said only the Father and Son know each other other than those Jesus reveals. Now that shows, for example, that the Holy Spirit which is not mentioned here in Matthew eleven twenty seven, doesn't know. Therefore, it should be clear that according to Jesus' words, obviously the Holy Spirit is not a co-equal member of the Greco-Roman uh, Trinity. But Jesus' views are consistent with the Binitarian view of the Godhead. Now, I said I explained the word Binitarian, so let me go over this. There was somebody who taught in the early 4th century that only the Father was God. And his name was Arius. And basically from the word Arius, people who followed him were called Arians. In time, that had to do with the Godhead. So we hear the word Unitarian, which means one, Arian. Okay. Then there's Vinitarian, which is two, Arian. And Trinitarian, which is three. So that's basically where the word came from. And the Binitarian view of the Godhead basically is that the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is the power of God, but that Christians can be born into the family of God. Anyway, now I want to go to another so-called apostolic father. This is somebody by the name of Ignatius. He is the first known leader to actually use the term Catholic Church. And around one... 100 to 115 A.D., there's arguments that maybe it's even later, wrote, For our God, Jesus Christ, was conceived by Mary in accord with God's plan of the seed of David. It's true. But also of the Holy Spirit. He was born and baptized so that by his submission he might purify the water. And that's his letter to the Ephesians. Again, this is not scripture. He also wrote, God appeared in human form to bring newness of eternal life. That's a reference, of course, again to Jesus. And then he says, Permit me to be an imitator of the passion of my God. So he's clearly recognizing Jesus as God. So there's no way Ignatius was a tra traditional Unitarian, nor was he Trinitarian. He also wrote, Ignatius, Blessed in greatness through the plenitude of God the Father, which has been foreordained before the ages to be forever abiding in unchangeable glory, united and elect in true passion by the will of the Father and of Jesus Christ our God, even unto the church, which is in Ephesus of Asia, worthy of all felicitation, abundant greeting in Christ Jesus and blameless joy. Oh, again, he's calling... Uh, Father and the Son, God. He wrote something similar to the Ephesians. Uh, don't need to read through that. Now, I want to read something from a theological scholar by the name of uh, Hurtado. Uh, he wrote, There are numerous places where Ignatius refers to Jesus as God. Uh, in Greek, that would be a Theos, Theos. Yet Ignatius refers to Jesus as Theos while portraying him as subordinate to the Father. And that is part of the Binitarian view. Trinitarians, modern Trinitarians say the Father and Son 
the Holy Spirit are co-equal members of the Godhead or a trinity. But early Christians didn't teach that. They taught the Father was God, Jesus was God, but subordinate to the Father, and the Holy Spirit did not teach was God. Now, early Christians were careful about avoiding the charge of ditheism, uh, and who basically would say God is one because God is one family, currently consisting of the Father and the Son, and that's it's a family relationship, in which the Father is greater than the Son, but it's also a family that the true Christians, the true saints, will uh, be part of. Now, even though Ignatius refers to the Father and the Son as God in two of his letters, and I looked, by the way, in the original Greek, he didn't do that with the Holy Spirit. Instead, he wrote, quote, this is to the Ephesians, using as a rope the Holy Spirit. Now, in the second century, Church of God leaders, who would be considered to be part of the original Catholic Church, taught the Father and the Son were God and didn't teach that about the Holy Spirit. This has been called the Binitarian view. Now, I want to read from a, a, a Greco-Roman Catholic scholar by the name of Monroy. He wrote, As for the Binitarian confessional formula, which confesses the Father and the Son, we likewise find examples in Polycarp and Ignatius. Now, this is true, and I mention this to let people realize it's just not the opinion of myself or the continuing Church of God that early people that the Roman Catholics and the Greek Orthodox and the Protestants for that matter considered to be saints taught that the Father was God, the Son was God, and not the Holy Spirit and held Benetarian positions. Scholars who've looked at this honestly will admit it. As some more quotes from Polycarp, which I, I'm, I'm not going to add into it, but basically he said he, one of the things Polycarp wrote is the God, Jesus Christ, God the Father. So he did uh, do that. Now I'd like to read something from uh, a scholar by the name of Alan F. Segal. And it's uh, called Summary Responses by Him to the International Conference on the Historical Origin of the Worship of Jesus. He writes, The argument that Christianity is not Binitarian, but Trinitarian, ignores the fact it's not so much as what Christianity thought of itself that counts, but how it appeared to be to its rabbinic critics. So the rabbis who were Jews were not converted Christians. From here we clearly say it was also described as often described as Binitarian or dualistic rather than Trinitarian. So early critics of the Christian church from the Jews, the rabbis, or teachers, said this is Benetarian religion. They didn't say Trinitarian. And this is uh, well known. Now I'd like to read something from the Greco-Roman saint uh, Justin Martyr. This is from his dialogue with Trifo. And again, these quotes are, are in his book. Again, it's free online at uh, www.ccog.org. He wrote, When Scripture says the Lord reigned fire from the Lord out of heaven, the prophetic word indicates that there were two in number. One upon the earth, who says it descended to behold the cry of Sodom, another in heaven, who is also the Lord of the Lord on earth. As he has Father and God, the cause of his Father, excuse me, the cause of his power and of his being Lord and God again, when the scripture records the gods in the beginning, behold, Adam become like one of us, this phrase, like one of us, is also indicative of a number. And the words do not admit of a figurative meaning as the sophists endeavor to affix to them, who are able neither to tell nor understand the truth. So he's saying that the sophists, the ones who thought they had this wisdom, they want to allegorize this, but no, it's, there's more than one being in the Godhead. Otherwise, he says, he wouldn't have used the word us. Now, the first scripture that he was referring to he meaning Justin Martyr was referring to was from Genesis 19, verse 24. I'd like to read something from a Trinitarian supporting website about that. It says, There are two Yahwehs in Genesis 19, 24. He cites genuine, he, he, this is translated here as, Then Yahweh, uh, on earth in human form, reigned on Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire, 
from Yahweh in spirit form in heaven out of heaven. Continuing, this says, there's simply no way to escape the clear context that there were two Yahwehs, one on earth that talked to Abraham and commanded Sodom to be destroyed, and the second Yahweh in heaven who actually sent the fire. But what this website, this Trinitarian, has realized is it's defending a Binitarian view of the Godhead. There was a second century uh, Greco Roman apologist named uh, Athenagoras, and he wrote, and the Son, being in the Father, and the Father in the Son, in oneness and power of spirit, the understanding and reason of the Father is the Son of God. The Holy Spirit, which operates in the prophets, we assert to be an affluence of God, flowing from Him and returning back like a beam of the Son. So again, that's a Benetarian position. Now, toward the end of the 2nd century, Melito of Sardis, who's considered to be a Church of God leader, as far as we're concerned, but considered to be a Greco-Roman and Protestant saint, at least a Greco-Roman too, wrote, For the deeds done by Christ after his baptism, and especially his miracles, gave indication and assurance to the world of the deity hidden in his flesh. For, being at once both God and perfect man likewise, he concealed the signs of his deity, even though he was true God existing before all ages. So we find out Melito clearly considered Christ to be God. And I read earlier, he considered the Father to be God. But he no, nowhere gives any indication that the Holy Spirit is, is a God. Uh, Melito held a Benetarian view of the Godhead. Here's what Melito wrote about the Holy Spirit. The tongue of the Lord, His Holy Spirit. In, in the psalm, my tongue is a pen. Melito also wrote, The finger of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, by whose operation the tables of the law in Exodus are said to have been written. Now, it says in Exodus 31, 18, that God wrote the Ten Commandments himself. So, what this shows is that Melito only considered the Holy Spirit to be a manifestation of the power of God, not a separate person. Now, instead of accepting what Melito wrote about the Godhead and Holy Spirit as related to the original faith, I want to read something from a Trinitarian scholar who is also an Anglican priest. He wrote, We understand that Melito bears witness to the truth as it was understood in his day and that the Orthodox faith has been gradually revealed. Huh? He's saying, okay, Melito wrote what people understood around 180 AD, roughly 150 years after Jesus was uh, resurrected, but they still didn't have it quite right. Oh, they had the New Testament, and, and we had people such as Polycarp, who knew the apostles. Ignatius may have known the apostles, or one or more of them, and they were teaching Benetarianism. And Melito, who was a successor to Polycarp, taught Benetarianism. Now, around the middle of the 4th century, uh, an Orthodox Catholic and Benetarian bishop by the name of uh, Marcellus of Ankara uh, wrote on the nature of God. And here's what he wrote. Now, with the heresy of the Areomaniacs, what were Areomaniacs? Areomaniacs were Arius followers, Unitarians, which has corrupted the Church of God. And he says, it's another type of Areomaniac. These then teach three hypostases, just as Valentinus, the, the her heresiarch, first invented in a book entitled him on the th called On the Three Natures. For he was first to invent three hypo hypostases and three persons of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he's discovered to have filched this from Hermes and Plato. So we've got a Greek Orthodox bishop in the 4th century saying this is a heresy, it's corrupted the Church of God, and these people teach three hypostases, and originally this came from Valentinus. Now who's Valentinus? He was an apostate who was denounced by Polycarp of Smyrna in the 2nd century. And yet, here he is, uh, as the one who came up with three hypostases, which, by the way, Emperor Constantine also endorsed that idea. Now there's another person who was an apostate, 
This is from one of the so-called Montanus oracles, which is spoken by the apostate Montanus, was, I am the Father and the Son and the Paraclete. Now this is one of the first references of a Trinitarian view of the Godhead. Uh, again, we're not sure which one is the earlier, the one from Montanus or the one from Valentinus. Now the term Paraclete is uh, used to signify the Holy Spirit. Uh, it comes from a Greek, the Greek word, Parakletos. So what we have is there were apostate Catholics who clearly taught the Trinity in the second century. And by the way, the Roman Catholic Church and Eastern Orthodox Church, and the Protestants, for that matter, do consider that Montanists and Valentinists were heretics or apostates. But they ended up with their views. Now here's something from the Greco-Roman Saint Irenaeus, who's considered to be a saint by the Protestants. As a matter of fact, some branches of Protestantism claim succession through Irenaeus. And Irenaeus said, or wrote, There is none other called God by scriptures except the Father of all and the Son, and those who possess the adoption. That is a Binitarian view. He said the scripture says it's only one through God, part of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Christians who become part of it, part of the family, the term adoption, family relationship. He says, Christians believe in the Father and Son. And again, he said there were only two. Then there was a the, uh, Roman Catholic Saint Hippolytus. Now he had some ties with Irenaeus. And he also held a Binitarian view of the Godhead. And so let me read some of what he wrote. This would be from the early 3rd century. And Irenaeus would have written late 2nd century. Hippolytus wrote, These things, then, brethren, are declared by the Scriptures and a blessed John in the testimony of his Gospel, giving us the account of this economy disposition and acknowledges this Word of God when he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and was with God, and the Word was God. If then the Word was with God and was also God, what follows? Would one say he speaks of two gods? I shall not indeed speak of two gods, but of one. Two persons, however, and a third disposition. And the grace of the Holy Ghost. The Father is indeed one, and there are two persons, because there is also the Son. So Hippolyta says it's a family relationship. It's the Father and the Son are God. He was elected, by the way, to be Bishop of Rome. This happened either after or near the time that Callistus who was a Roman, who ended up being a Roman bishop, he paid a bribe to at least get access to that office. Now, the Catholic Encyclopedia said that Callistus obtained great influence over the ignorant and illiterate grasping Zephrinus by bribes. Now, Zephrinus, Zephyrinus, if you want to pronounce it, was a bishop of Rome, and he took bribes from Callistus. We're not told, this is again from the Catholic Encyclopedia, we're not told, told how it came about. Callistus became archdeacon and then Pope. The orthodoxy of Callistus is challenged by both Hippolytus and Tertullian. So let's talk about that. Hippolyt, uh, Hippolytus, who I just read from, said that this guy can't be. He's not a Christian. So, and he, so others said, yeah, you're right. Callistus is not the guy. And so, they, so Hippolytus, people said he should have been. He was the clergy, the Roman clergy went for him. Then Tertullian, who had been part of the Roman Catholic Church, split as well. It's like, this Callistus can't be. He's not a Christian. Now, while I do believe that Hippolytus and Tertullian compromised a lot, and were not true Church of God Christians, they saw Callistus was really bad. Uh, also, Callistus supported abortion. You know, he was charged with simony, which is paying bribes for ecclesiastical office. He also was involved in other forms of immorality. Yet, the uh, Church of Rome decided to claim apostolic succession through Callistus and not Hippolytus. Now, what's interesting is that this third century Roman Catholic Saint Hippolytus has been called, quote, Rome's most important theologian in the pre-Constantinian era. One perhaps can be forgiven for believing that Callistus 
has been claimed to be the true successor in Rome and not Hippolytus because Rome adopted the Trinity in 381 and Hippolytus clearly didn't hold that view. By the way, in the 3rd and 4th centuries, Lucian of Antioch, uh, who was uh, a Sabbath keeper, apparently a Church of God Vinitarian as well, and he was a Vinitarian according to other sources. Now, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, I should point it out that the Hebrew word for spirit, uh, which we would pronounce somewhere like ruach, is feminine. And the Greek term in the New Testament, pneuma, is neuter. In Syriac, the word for uh, spirit is uh, feminine. So the idea is that the Holy Spirit is masculine. You'll see the word, the pronoun he, frequently in the New Testament. That's not appropriate. Let me read something from, a, from Dr. Wallace, who's a Greek scholar on this. He wrote, There is no text in the New Testament that clearly or even probably affirms the personality of the Holy Spirit through the route of Greek grammar. As far as Scripture is concerned, the pronoun, quote, he, is not properly applicable to the Holy Spirit. Now, as far as Trinitarian practices go, I want to read something from the late Cardinal James Gibbons, because he wrote, most Christians pray to the Holy Ghost, a practice found nowhere in the Bible. Right, it's not in this book. So we don't do it in the continuing Church of God. We do have a booklet on prayer, by the way, uh, that we have, is available at ccog.org. Okay, but you don't pray to the Holy Spirit, and the early Christians didn't do that. Now, we are to pray to receive the Holy Spirit. But uh, praying the Holy Spirit is not an original Christian or Catholic position. The person head of the Holy Spirit was debated and then accepted by Greco-Roman councils in the fourth uh, century. Now, I mentioned Cardinal Gibbons. I want to read something that he wrote, and I want you to think about this, particularly if you're Roman Catholic. No new dogma, dogma unknown to the apostles not contained in the primitive Christian revelation, can be admitted. For the apostles received the whole deposit of God's word according to the promise of the Lord. So he's saying you're not supposed to change what they originally had, which is in the Bible or what the early people saw. Yet the reality is that Trinitarianism, the, the personhood of the Holy Spirit, Sunday is a Christian day of worship, Christmas, eating unclean meats, having Passover Easter on Sunday, and many other Greco-Roman Protestant practices were unknown to the original apostles, and they're not in the Bible. Now, did Jesus, talking about the Godhead, empty himself of his divinity when he was born of Mary? Yes, I want to go to Philippians 2, verse 7. We read, and this will be from a Catholic translation, Roman Catholic translation. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of man, and in habit found as man. Or, that's from the DRB, now this is from the NJB. He emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, becoming as human beings are, and being in every way like a human being. Jesus became human just like we are. Vinitarians, like those of us the continuing Church of God, teach that Jesus was fully human on the earth. And that's consistent with Scripture and early beliefs. Trinitarians, however, normally teach that Jesus was fully God and fully human when he was on the earth. But uh, one of the early so-called apostolic fathers, Ignatius, in the second century, wrote, For he, that's Jesus, became man in order to undergo temptation, that he might be capable of being tempted, dishonored, crucified, and suffering death. And we agree with that. Now I'm going to read Hebrews 2, verse 18. Because as far as Jesus himself goes, the New Testament makes it clear he was tempted. Hebrews 2, 18. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Now consider that in James 1, verse 13, it says God cannot be te tempted by evil. Now, in James 1.13 and Hebrews 2.11, the same Greek word for tempted is used. 
Now let's go to Hebrews 4. Going to verse 14. Having therefore a great high priest that hath passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we have not a high priest who cannot have compassion on our infirmities, but one tempted in all things like as we are yet without sin. And humans, of course, can sin. Therefore, these verses clearly show that Jesus was not fully God after his incarnation and prior to his resurrection. Consider the Bible teaches that God can't lie. And for Jesus has been tempted in all things like we are, so he could have compassion on our infirmities, he had to be capable of actually sinning. If he was not, then he's not tempted like us. And since God can't sin, and Scripture can't be broken, we've got to conclude that Jesus was not fully God while on earth. Because if he was fully God on earth, he was not tempted like we are. But since Jesus was tempted as we are, he was not fully God on, when he was on the earth. Furthermore, I want to read something from Polycarp. Because uh, Polycarp understood that Jesus actually died and needed to be resurrected. He wrote, and this is around 135 AD, Jesus Christ who for our sins suffered even unto death, but whom God raised from the dead, having loosed the bands of the grave. He who raised him up from the dead will raise us up also, if we do his will, walk in his commandments, and love what he loved. The false Jesus that Trinitarians actually claim to worship didn't give up all so humans could be saved. He wasn't subject to transgressions like humans. Didn't have to have, really have the faith to rely on the, the Father for miracles in his resurrection. He didn't really die. He didn't need his Father's resurrection. Hence, he didn't really come in the flesh. I mean, that's the logical conclusion of what Trinitarian really stands for. Now, even though Trinitarians don't word it that way, their view of Jesus is warned about by the Apostle John. I'm going to read from just Second John. I'm going to read verse 7. Many deceivers have gone out into the world. People who did not confess Jesus Christ came in the flesh. This is a deceiver and antichrist. If Jesus was fully God when he was on the earth, he did not truly come in the flesh. Because he wouldn't have been, because again, it said he had to be tempted like us. Now the passage, by the way, doesn't say, mean that antichrist wouldn't believe that there was a Jesus. Even many atheists acknowledge the historical fact of Jesus, as do the demons. The passage is saying the Antichrist teaching is that Jesus was not truly human when he was incarnate, and he certainly was. The original Catholic belief was that Jesus emptied himself of his divinity, became fully human, was tempted, and allowed himself to be put to actual death in order to be our Savior. Now what about 1 John 5, 7, and 8? Is that proof of the Trinity? Well, People realized that was added. Now, there are some pseudo-scholars who claim that, oh, it wasn't really added, it was really there. And so they can quote somebody who comes up with that opinion, but against the facts. And we can prove this. I want to talk about something called the Codex Amiantinus. It's believed to be closest to the original document that Jerome, the Roman Catholic saint and doctor of their church, originally translated. And it, this document is so important according to the Roman Catholic Church that the Catholic Cyclopedia says, Codex Amiatinus, the most celebrated manuscript of the Latin and Vulgate Bible, remarkable as the best witness to the true text of St. Jerome. Now, this differs from later texts, okay, which include stuff in 1 John 5 that's not there. And the added words that were not there. Um, this will not come out really clear here, but this is the actual text uh, from uh, the Codex Amiatinus. And again, you can see this again if you, because uh, uh, I have it in this book. And basically, it simply wasn't there. Here's what First John 5. 7 and 8 
as shown in the uh, Codex Sianicus says, For they that testify are three, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are one. The added statements found in some translations aren't in here either. So where did they get put in? Uh, Dr. Wallace uh, believes that uh, it was, uh, uh, says, basically says the 10th century. It says the earliest manuscript, Codex number 221, includes this marginal note, which was added after the original composition. Thus there's no sure evidence of this in any Greek manuscript until the 1500s. And that was composed uh, later. The, the Trinitarian formula known as the Kama jo Johannium made its way into the third edition of Erasmus's Greek New Testament in 1522 because of pressure from the Catholic Church. In reality, the issue is history, not heresy. How can one argue that the Kama Johannium must go back to the original text when it didn't appear until the 16th century in any Greek manuscripts. So anyway, so what basically happened is some believe that a monk on the side when you note, put a side note and said something and then people just added that in there. Again, so that, that simply wasn't part of uh, the Bible and so so Protestants sometimes will hold up and say, oh, this is the Bible, and this is proof. As far as Protestantism goes, uh, I would challenge anyone who considers himself Protestant to read this book, Hope of Salvation, How the Continuing Church of God Differs from Protestantism, because I contend that Protestantism does not believe in sola scriptura, but uh, relies a lot on tradition and misunderstanding and mistranslations. And also church history demonstrates there was nothing that... Uh, resembling modern Protestantism in the early church. Uh, if you find that uh, shocking, why don't you prove me wrong? So far, since we've had this book out, no Protestants uh, attempted to do that. Probably because when they read the scriptures and the historical references, they don't have much to add. Well, they may not believe it, and it's sad that people will th believe things that are not the truth. Anyway, now I'd like to... Uh, read something from uh, Roman Catholic Cardinal Newman. He condemned somebody who's Vinitarian. It says, Lucian, whose schism schismaticizer was excommunicated, held heretical tenets of a different nature that were later called semi-Arian or Vinitarian. And the other problem he said they had over in Antioch is that they had Judaism. So this uh, Lucian was a, a leader in the 3rd and 4th century. He was killed in the 4th century. And so he practiced some form of what's called Judeo-Christianity. Uh, we believe this means he was a Sabbath keeper and a Benetarian. And the other thing about him, according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, he was not an allegorist. He actually thought the Bible meant what it said. And he was opposed to the allegorists. And we in the Continuing Church of God had the same position. But he was uh, condemned because he believed the Bible meant what it said. Now, it's a fa also a fact, by the way, that Eastern Orthodox patriarchs in the 4th century held to a semi-Aryan or Vinitarian view of the Godhead. I'll read something from the Catholic Encyclopedia. Towards the middle of the 4th century, Macedonius, bishop of Constantinople, and after him, a number of semi-Arians, while apparently admitting the divinity of the word, denied that of the Holy Ghost. Furthermore, the Catholic Encyclopedia reported that the semi-Arians or the Vinitarians were, quote, the conservative majority in the East in the 4th century. And this also included, by the way, people such as the famous uh, Greco-Roman church historian Eusebius, and actually, 85 to 90 percent of the bishops who attended the uh, Council of Nicaea in 325 were not Trinitarian, according to, uh, this is from a Roman Catholic citation there. In the 18th century, uh, Sir Isaac Newton, the scientist, uh, he, he noted that uh, Trinity was a late arrival. Here's some, something about him. It says, he traced the doctrine of the Trinity to Athanasius, 
for, who was around from 298 to 373. Now I trace it earlier to Montanus and Valentinus. But uh, anyway, this says that Newton was convinced that prior to Athanasius, the church had no Trinitarian doctrine. Newton, Newton further asserted that in order to support Trinitarianism, the church deliberately corrupted the Bible by adding something to 1 John 5. And I mentioned that. And, it, and how Newton also thought, this is where Newton is wrong, the seventh seal began when Trinitarian was officially ratified in the Council of Constantinople. The great apostasy was not Romanism, but Trinitarianism, the false infernal religion, to quote uh, Newton's own words. Well, anyway, I don't believe that the, he was right on when the uh, seven seals opened in uh, 381, but it could be around 381 when the church fled to the wilderness. But that's a, another topic that we'll get into later. Anyway, the reality is in the middle of the 4th century, even many major religion, leaders of the Greco-Roman churches endorsed a semi-Aryan and not Trinitarian positions. And in 359, there was even a semi-Aryan council of uh, Seleucia attended by uh, Greco-Roman leaders, church leaders. But they changed their minds on it, and it officially changed the Council of Constantinople in 381. To ensure that people would be forced into accepting the Trinity, Emperor Theodosius, just before calling the Council of Constantinople, here's what Theodosius declared. Let us believe in the one deity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in equal majesty, in a holy trinity. So he's saying they're all the same. That was not the early Christian view. We authorize the followers of this law to assume the title Catholic Christians. But as for others, since in our judgment they are foolish madmen, we decree that uh, they shall be branded with the uh, ignominious name of heretics and shall not presume to give them their uh, convectibles in the name of churches. They will suffer in the first place the chastisement of divine condemnation and the second the punishment of our authority. In accordance with the will of heaven shall decide to inflict. So this is from, by the way from Theodosian Code number uh, uh, 16 1.2. So we see that they needed the force of the Imperial Roman punishment against non-Trinitarians. Now, I want to read something from a historical scholar by the name of uh, Jonathan Roberts. He wrote, Until Theodosius commanded his subjects to believe in the doctrine of the Trinity and enforce his commands upon them in the most inhuman ways, that doctrine was rejected and resisted by the Greek and Roman followers of Christ. From Theodosius' decree forward, Greco-Romans attended to call those of us who held to the original Catholic beliefs by names such as heretics and Nazarenes. Also, to avoid persecution, those who held the original Catholic beliefs tended not to call themselves Catholic Christians in public. Now, while some have said that the Trinity was the central doctrine of the New Testament, I want to read something from a modern historian, Dr. Bart Ehrman. He wrote, Like other doctrines that became central to the faith, Belief in the Trinity was a historical development, not a given in the early years of the faith. The basic notion of the Trinity is there's three persons in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're equally God of the same substance. The doctrine does not appear to be a doctrine pronounced by the historical Jesus, Paul, or any other Christian writer during the first hundred years or so of Christianity. It cannot be found explicitly stated in early Christian writings. The earliest thing has to do with uh, 1 John 5, 7, and that wasn't done until, uh, he said, the 11th century. And of course, the terms Trinity, Threeness, and Trinitarian are not found in the Bible. Now, in the 6th century A.D., centuries after the Greco-Romans changed and adopted the Trinity, there was this so-called Athanasian Creed. They don't believe Athanasius actually wrote it. He goes far, sorry, you can't be saved unless you believe in the Trinity. Here's what it said, part of what it says. The Trinity in unity is to be worshipped. He therefore that will be saved, let him thus think of the Trinity. Now, the Bible says that you've got to believe in God, and accept Jesus as Savior to be saved. It doesn't teach anything about the Trinity and salvation. Yet the promotion of this false 
creed has been widespread amongst the Greco-Romans, the Lutherans, and some Anglicans. Matter of fact, it's from the Lutherans that I found it originally, because I hadn't heard of it before. Now what about the Theophilus of Antioch? The Theophilus of Antioch was a Church of God leader. But the Catholic Encyclopedia claims, or first part is they get it right, in Scripture there's no single term by which the three divine persons are denoted together. That I got that right. The word of trias, in which the Latin trinitas is a translation, is first found in Theophilus of Antioch, about 180. Afterward, it appears in its Latin form as trinitas in Tertullian. But Theophilus didn't teach the Trinity. Uh, and a lot of people look at the mistranslations from his writings to Auto, uh, Autolycus, Book 2, Chapter uh, 15. Uh, it's, uh, here's how it should be translated. I, I won't read the mistranslation. They are all over the internet. In like manner, also three days, which were before the luminaries, are types of the three of God. No, so said, okay, so it sounds like Trinitarianism to, to you maybe, but it's not. His word and his wisdom. And the fourth is the type of man who needs light so they may be found, they may be God, the word Wisdom, man. Now, some might say, oh, it's just semantics. He's still talking about the Trinity. But he's not. Why? Because the third part is what Theophilus was teaching human beings become. And that's what he was teaching. That humans are a fourth type, and but will become God. And he verified this when the Theophilus wrote, If I call him wisdom, I speak of his offspring. Yes, as Christians, we are God's offspring. He also wrote, for if he had made him immortal from the beginning, he would have made him God, so that he should incline to things of immortality. Keeping the commandments of God, he should receive as a reward from him immortality and should become God. So yes, Theophilus was teaching that human beings should become God, and that's what he was referring to uh, as the third part. He taught deification. That's consistent with the Benetarian view of uh, God being one family, and thus being in the family of God. As far as deification goes, the, 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 officially, by the way, the Greco-Roman churches do teach it. Ignatius of Antioch wrote, It's good to set from the world unto God that I may rise again to him. It will be granted to me to attain to God. Now, as far as getting back to Theophilus, he didn't teach that the Holy Spirit was or would be one of the third people of a trinity. And he verified this, because here's what he wrote about the Spirit of God. If I say he is spirit, I speak of his breath. The whole creation is contained by the Spirit of God, and the containing spirit is along the, the creation contained by the hand of God. So, obviously, Theophilus didn't teach the Greco-Roman Trinity. He taught that the third part had to do with deification. Now, Tertullian, who followed Montanus, he did teach a, 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 the threeness, but it wasn't even the Trinity as the Greco-Romans now teach it. Now, in, our, in this book, I have a list of Binitarians and Trinitarians. I want to list, read the Binitarian list here. Ignatius, 1st, 2nd century. Polycarp, 1st, 2nd century. Justin Martyr, 2nd century. Athenagoras, 2nd century. Melito, 2nd century. Theophilus, 2nd century. Irenaeus, 2nd century. Hippolytus, 3rd century. Lucian, 3rd, 4th century. Eusebius, 4th century. Now, everyone in that Benetarian list is considered to be a saint by at least some of the Greco-Roman Catholics. When, here's a list of uh, the three earliest Trinitarians that I could find. Valentinus, he was denounced by Polycarp. He was in the 2nd century. Montanus, he was denounced by Serapion of Antioch, who was a Church of God leader, 2nd century. Then Tertullian, who followed Montanus, and they used in the 2nd and 3rd century. And all of those on that Trinitarian list are considered to be heretics by the Greco-Roman Catholics. Now, some have asserted that Benetarianism just sprang up in the 4th century because of uh, uh, Arian controversies, but that's simply not true. It was the original belief. And the same people tell you it sprung up, say, 
Well, yeah, it's true that they didn't have a fully developed understanding of the Holy Spirit in the second and third centuries, and they finally got it in the late fourth century. No. Early Christians knew about the Godhead. Vinitarianism didn't just spring up. It was original. I should also point out that uh, in the third century, Origen of Alexandria uh, taught something that was sort of a cross between Trinitarianism and uh, 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 Vinitarianism. And then there was somebody else in the third century. His name was uh, Gregory of, uh, uh, well, he's, well, he's actually called Gregory the Wonder Worker. And he trained under Origen, and he basically seemed to be have demonic power. He had power over the demons. Supposedly, uh, he could cast his cloak over a man and cause his, his death. He claimed to see an apparition of Mary. He claimed to see the uh, Apostle John as well. He seems to be the first one to talk about the Holy Virgin and the Holy Trinity. Because he wrote, Here where the mystery of the Holy Trinity was revealed by the Archangel to the Holy Virgin according to the Gospel. And so... Uh, he's one of the first ones to use the term uh, Trinity or Holy Trinity. And he claimed to get this from an apparition of the Apostle John. He said, There is a perfect Trinity. He said, The Apostle John supposedly told him in an apparition, There is a perfect Trinity in glory and eternity and sovereignty. Neither divided nor estranged. The same Trinity abides forever. Now, claiming the Trinity abides forever is a false gospel. It's a closed Godhead, is what they teach. And that's conflict in conflict with God's plan. For peoples that, for example, Ignatius and Theophilus of Antioch understood. And furthermore, neither the Apostle John nor his successors in Asia Minor, which is where the Apostle John died, is believed to die, they weren't Trinitarian. And the Apostle Paul warned about this kind of thing happening in Galatians 1 verse 8. So, but even if we ourselves or an angel from heaven preaches to you another gospel other than the one that we preach to you, let God's curse be on him. Now, just because Gregory claimed to have seen or heard Jesus' mother and the Apostle John, that's not a reason to accept something that's not in conflict with the original faith. And uh, I'll talk more about... Uh, 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 Gregory the Wonder Worker uh, later. Now anyway, as far as the 4th century goes, it was Emperor Constantine, whose pagan religion taught a trinity, that endorsed uh, the Trinitarian position put forth by Athanasius at the Council of Nicaea in 325. Yet even at that council, 75 to 80 percent of the people who attended were Binitarian or semi-Arian. And I want to read something from uh, a Catholic encyclopedia. The second formula of Sirmium, 357 AD, the semi-Aryan bishops assembled at Ankara, the Episcopal city of their leader, issued a formula asserting that the Son is in all things like the Father, afterwards approved by the Third Synod of Sirmium 358. This formula was signed by a few Orthodox bishops and probably by Pope Liberius. Okay, so in the middle of the 4th century, there were Trinitarian councils, even though Constantine endorsed Trinitarianism, so we started to see some Trinitarianism uh, flourish. And we have Gregory the Wonder Worker, who a century before started to push Trinitarianism, which starting to come up. Pope signed a Trinitarian statement. In the Council of Rimini in 359, nearly 400 bishops uh, were there, they decided to sign a semi-Aryan creed. That's from another Roman Catholic source. Here's from the historian uh, Socrates Scholasticus, 5th century, talking about this uh, synod. We believe that it was an appointment by God as well as the command of your piety that we, the bishops of the West, came out of the various districts to Rimini in order that the faith of our Catholic Church might be detected. 
God the Father, through Jesus Christ our God, the Lord, the power ruling the world. So 400 of them got together and said, the Catholic Church believes in Binitarianism. Okay, they didn't use the word Binitarianism, but that's what they were teaching, or Semi-Arianism. Also, in the 4th century, Bishop of Rome, which they called Pope Liberius, excommunicated the Trinitarian champion Athanasius. And he also signed a Benetarian statement. 367, Council of Tyana accepted the letter of Liberius pronouncing the semi-Arian bishops to be orthodox. A few years later, from 373 AD, a man by the name of Demophilus was the patriarch of Constantinople. Now the current Nicene Creed, which was adopted in 381 at the Council of Constantinople, was convened by Emperor Theodosius. And this met resistance before acceptance. Understand that Theodosius, the Emperor Theodosius, removed Demophilus from being the Patriarch of Constantinople because Demophilus would not accept the Emperor's Trinitarian Nicene Creed. So here's something from uh, the 5th century Greco-Roman historian, Socrates Classicus. He wrote, When the emperor found the church in this state, he began to consider by what means he could make peace, effect a union, and enlarge the churches. Immediately, he uh, int intimated his desire to Demophilus, who presided over the Arian party, really meaning semi-Arian, and inquired whether he was willing to assent to the Nicene Creed, and thus unite the people and establish concord. Upon Demophilus' declaring to accede to this proposal, the emperor said to him, Since you reject peace and unanimity, I order you to quit the churches. So in other words, the head patriarch of the Eastern Orthodox Church told the emperor, I won't accept your Trinitarianism. The emperor said, okay, you're not the Ted Patriarch anymore. No, 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 you have to go away. So when Demophilus heard, this again from his classic Socrates writing, heard, weighing himself with the difficulty of contending against the superior power, he convoked his followers in the church, and standing in the midst of them, said, Brethren, it's written in the gospel, if they persecute you in one city, flee yet to another. Since therefore the emperor excludes us from the churches, take notice that we will henceforth hold our assemblies without the city. So we have here the head of the Orthodox Church said, I won't put up with this, and he left. So obviously Trinitarianism was not the position that the Patriarchy of Constantinople. Now I know the Eastern Orthodox like to say that they never changed. They actually say that they're purer than the Romans who changed. Well, the Eastern Orthodox clearly changed. They clearly had leaders who were Binitarian or Semi-Arian. As a matter of fact, I went and looked before at their so-called apostolic sees, and there's evidence of every one of the four of them having at least one uh, Semi-Arian or Binitarian. Now, even the official website, the Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople, once admitted that the Arian Semi-Arians ruled that sea for at least 40 years in the 4th century. It's not there anymore. Now, it was there when I checked it out in uh, April of 2010, but when I checked in the last couple of weeks, it's not there anymore, but it's still true. The fact that they don't put it up there anymore doesn't change the facts. And the reality is, there was no, they had no bishops prior to the 4th century who were Trinitarian. The pagan convert Theodosius declared the Trinity to be the official policy of the empire in 380 AD. And so that should help demonstrate that it certainly was not the official original position. <laughs> Binitarianism did not just spring forth, as I said before, but was the original position. Now, why do these things happen? Well, there's a couple of different things. Uh, there are different reasons for different times. One of which was there was a loss of love of the truth. Uh, you can see scriptures warning about that. By the way, in this book, I've got a lot of scriptures where I just cite the scriptures you can look up. Anyway, 
Anyway, different reasons, different times. But one of them was loss of love of the truth. One was fear. And Satan's used fear and still uses fear to get people to do things. There was also false intellectualism. There's also worldly philosophy, personal vanity, financial reasons, as well as accepting false documents. Plus, I mentioned about Gregory the Wonder Worker. There were signs and malign wonders. And there was political compromise. And this is known. Political compromise for the Trinity was known. Now, part of the reasons for the change, according to uh, Pope uh, Benedict, uh, he's the Emeritus Pope Benedict, were innovations from the 2nd and 3rd century Alexandrians, Clement and Origen. Okay? Innovations. An innovation means a change. So he's admitting that there were changes. And I mentioned before that uh, Origen of Alexandria was kind of moving in that direction. Now, here's an explanation given by the Roman Catholic Cardinal Newman to why they made various uh, changes. Confiding then in the power of Christianity to resist the infection of evil and to transmute the very instruments and appendages of demon worship to evangelical use. Look, they wanted to change the very instruments and penances demon worship to evangelical use. The rules of the church from early times were prepared, should the occasion arise, to adopt, imitate, or sanctify the existing rights and customs of the population, as well as the philosophy of the educated class. And at the time of Emperor Constantine, uh, Mithraism had a trinity. Constantine believed it, but the educated class believed it. Anyway, getting back to what Newman wrote, he says, St. Gregory Thaumaturgus, that's Gregory the Wonder Worker, supplies the first instance of this economy. In other words, Newman is saying it wasn't until this guy did these signs and lying wonders popped up over two centuries after Jesus was resurrected that it looked like a good idea to compromise to let everybody in. Now, he wasn't the only one because earlier in the third century, Callistus did as well, but anyway. And it says, uh, a lot of people came in, the people assembled, and he made merry, and they held festivals. This, indeed, was proof of his great wisdom. In other words, when they adopted more pagan stuff, people liked it. The pagans did. And he's saying this was good. He allowed them to be uh, uh, jovial and gay at the monuments of the holy martyrs. So in other words, that's when idolatry started to come in. Because look, you guys worship these idols. We're going to rename them and call them Catholic saints, Greco Roman saints, or whatever. And so he did that. Now the Bible warns that you shouldn't do this. I'm going to go to James four verse four. James four verse four. This is from the Dewey Rames. Adulterers. Know you not that the friendship of this world is the enemy of God? Whosoever therefore would be a friend of this world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think that Scripture says in vain, to envy does the, sir, the Spirit covet which dwells in you? Now I'd also like to go to 1 Corinthians 10, starting verse 20. The Apostle Paul was inspired to write, But the things which the heathens sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you would be partakers with devils. You cannot drink the chalice of the Lord and the chalice of devils. You cannot be partakers of the table of the Lord and the table of devils. Now for Eastern Orthodox, I'm going to read from the Eastern Orthodox Bible the same passages. 1 Corinthians 10, starting verse 20. No, but I say to you the things to Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I don't want you to have fellowship to demons. You cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons as well. Yet, that's what Gregory the Wonder Worker did. That's what Emperor Constantine did. And that's what Cardinal Newman was saying was a great thing to do. Now, and are there any prophetic ramifications to all this? Well, actually, there are. Right now, there's a interfaith and ecumenical movement going about. And in terms of the uh, uh, ecumenical movement, 
In the 21st century, the Vatican issued a handbook called The Bishop in Christian Unity, an Ecumenical Vedamicum. And it basically divides professing Christians into two groups. One that accepts Trinitarian Godhead uh, definition is adopted by the 381 Council of Constantinople. And the other that doesn't accept it. The Vatican's handbook only calls for ecumenical unity with the first group. So they say that they're just looking for Trinitarians. Now, interestingly, that's also consistent with the Trinitarian position adopted last century by the World Council of Churches. Now, while the Church of Rome is not officially part of the World Council of Churches, I think the World Council of Churches does a lot to promote Rome's ecumenical movement. Basically, the World Council of Churches is made up of Protestants and the Eastern Orthodox. I'm holding up books on those particular uh, faiths. Now, this isn't just on the Eastern Orthodox, but the Eastern Orthodox, if they really believe that they have the original faith, I challenge them to read this book and explain to me how they have the original faith when using their translations of the Bible, uh, as well as Roman Catholic ones and others, uh, historical references demonstrate that they don't hold to the original faith. Anyway, in, uh, on December 22nd, 1961, the World Council of Churches approves a Trinitarian basis for Christianity. That's what uh, uh, Christianity Today reported. Now, this is also still in effect now. I checked this out. still in the 21st century. Uh, the World Council of Churches only accepts uh, Trinitarians. So since we in the Continuing Church of God uh, don't accept the Trinitarian adoption, uh, we wouldn't be a target for, for them. So, what's all this mean? It's a biblical fact that the New Testament endorsed Trinitarianism. Not, did not endorse Trinitarianism. Excuse me for slip of the tongue. Did not endorse Trinitarianism. Somebody added something there uh, later, but that was not the case. Scholars have looked at this say, actually, the New Testament endorses Binitarianism, a term most people haven't heard. When you look at the writings of so-called early apostolic fathers, they also endorsed Binitarianism. If you look out through church history, you see a bishop of Rome approved some type of Binitarian statement and saying that was orthodox, by the way. Then you look at Eastern Orthodox leaders, and you find that many of them, they knew were uh, Benetarian. And I mentioned before, even amongst Roman Catholic leaders, their Saint Hippolytus was also Benetarian, as their Saint uh, Irenaeus, uh, uh, Justin Martyr, uh, and uh, Eusebius, the historian. The reality is Trinitarianism was not part of the original faith. But by it was introduced by apostates, at least initially introduced by apostates, such as Montanus and uh, Valentinus. It was promoted by somebody who put out a false gospel, Gregory the Wonder Worker, in the third century. It was endorsed by Emperor Constantine in the fourth century, and I should mention he also used the term hypostasis, uh, and or some, no, not hypostasis, a uh, uh, hobo. He, he endorsed a term, uh, and I should have put it in here, but I'm sorry, I ran over it. He endorsed various aspects of Trinitarianism, but it still wasn't fully accepted. So Theodosius had to kick out the patriarch of Constantinople, put somebody else in, to enforce Trinitarianism. Throughout history, starting with Theodosius, non-Trinitarians were called names. Throughout history, we in the Church of God have been called names because we haven't endorsed uh, the Trinitarian view. And because we still don't, I wouldn't be surprised if we were called uh, extremists and others because we hold to the original faith. And in the end times, we see that who they're interested in unifying with within the professing Christian world are the Trinitarians, not the Binitarians. Political compromise has gotten people to accept Trinitarianism. Threats have gotten people to accept Trinitarianism. Mistranslations and misteachings have gotten people to accept Trinitarianism. 
but the Word of God does not endorse it. It was not a belief of the original Catholic Church. Binitarianism is the original view of the Godhead. It's the view that we, the continuing Church of God, hold and will continue to hold to. It is part of the original faith. Do not be deceived by others who are pushing a false narrative, an innovation that came in later times, but certainly did not come from the Bible, nor did it come from the mouth of your Savior. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.